they did not know anything about diseases of the mind. They had no concept of psychological illness, depression, anxiety. I just visited a 16-year-old uh, two days ago at UMC Hospital, and she uh, tried to commit suicide uh, because of depression and anxiety. And so diseases of the mind are very prevalent today, as they were prevalent some 2,000 uh, years ago. They were prevalent back then as well, except they didn't know uh, anything about depression or anxiety or emotional issues or psychological issues, and so everything was dumped on demon possession. You know, you were not of the right mind, therefore you had a demon. So you had to take the demon out. And so everything was blamed on demons. Today, we have made progress in that area of our understanding that emotional issues, uh, psychological issues, issues of the mind have much to do with uh, our emotional health, our psychological health. And that is then correlated with our spiritual health, which is very important to get that in order because when Jesus heals our spirit, he heals our mind. And let's look at uh, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5. Right from the very beginning, Jesus heals a man with evil spirits. Jesus and his disciples arrived on the other side of Lake Galilee, in the territory of Gerasa. As soon as Jesus got out of the boat, he was met by a man who came out of the burial caves there. This man had an evil spirit in him and lived among the tombs. Where did he live? Where did he live? He lived in the cemetery. He was, in other words, a dead man walking. He was alive, but he was dead inside. This man lived among the caves. He lived in the cemetery. A lot of people who are depressed, people who have no meaning, people who are suicidal, people who are afflicted with psychological diseases or emotional problems are people who are dead inside. They live among the caves. They live in a tomb. This is where this man lived. He lived in the tomb. People who have no purpose, people who are lonely, people in the casinos, hmm? <laughs> who are just, you know, trying to kill their loneliness, kill their inside pain that they feel, you know, with the buttons. Okay? People who are alcoholics, they're trying to kill something, are they not? You know, with the bottle. They're in a cave, they're in a tomb. People who are on drugs, you know, this 16-year-old says to me this, this week, the one that I visited, uh, she says, you know, nobody loves me, nobody cares for me. I'm ugly. My parents don't pay attention to me. Everybody has a boyfriend, Father, and I don't. Because I'm fat. There's something wrong on the inside, right? She's in a, she's in a tomb. How many people are like that in their own life? You know, uh, people who are online, 
looking to hook up with other people, people who are addicted to all sorts of terrible things like pornography, people who are addicted to shopping, they're just shopping and their credit cards are all maxed out and they still shop, you know, and shop. People who are addicted to their work. So, you can live in a tomb. This man lives in a tomb. He's alive, but he's in a tomb. He's in the cemetery. He's dead inside. He has no life in him. This man had an evil spirit in him. This is what evil wants to do to you. Evil wants to rob you of life. Jesus said, I have come that you may have life. This is John 10.10, 10, chapter 10, verse 10. I have come that you may have life and have it in abundance. When you have Jesus in you, when you have God in you, and when you have God's Spirit in you, you have life. Hence, this is precisely why here we are talking about evil spirits and we are to have the Holy Spirit in us. When we have the Holy Spirit, we rid ourselves of evil spirits. And evil spirits are those things which want to bring death to us. The Bible says that sin leads to death. The Spirit brings life into us. Sin leads the person to death. When you look all around us here in Las Vegas, we are surrounded with a lot of dead people who are alive, but they're dead. Uh, there's a new show uh, that opened up in uh, the Paris Casino uh, called the uh, Inferno. Uh, which of course refers to hell. How fitting for a lot of people who visit Las Vegas are in hell. The definition of hell is when you don't have God in your life. The absence of God is hell. Hell is a state of being, as heaven is the is a state of being as well. It's not like it's an actual physical place. It's a spiritual place. That's where souls live. It's the spirit world, not an actual place that you're going to go to. You can have hell here, and you can have heaven here. And then you can continue your heaven, which is the presence of God in the life to come, in your eternal life, when you leave here. I had a couple of priests who were visiting, and they apparently went to that show. And one of them went to the bathroom, and the other one was apparently waiting for him to come out of the bathroom, and he was waiting there uh, in the Paris in the Paris Casino, uh, right outside, uh, there in the passageway. And he says that some uh, woman uh, dressed in a, in a dress that you apparently, first you'd have to put Crisco on your body in order to get into it. <laughs> and, uh, with big heels. And apparently she comes up and she says, you want to have a good time? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, there's a lot of people who are looking for instantaneous pleasure in heaven. 
we look for our heaven in the presence of God. God brings us heaven. You know, happiness is here and gone. Uh, today, uh, I'm going to go and visit a seven-year-old who is dying of cancer. Uh, his name is Daniel. And you think his, his family is uh, happy? Of course not. But they're people of faith. And their faith brings them joy in the midst of everything that they're going through. Though I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, I'm not going to allow all these external forces like cancer, these little boys dying of cancer, to rob me of my joy. And I'm not going to look for heaven in sin. Sin only brings death. Sin brings death. God brings life to us. And so, in that sense, we have to rid our lives of sin. When we get away from sin, we bring life into us. When we lead the life that God wants us to lead, which is a life of forgiveness, all the people who are dead inside because they're holding on to grudges or resentment or they haven't forgiven or they live in the past. That kills you on the inside. You're always thinking about everything that everyone's done to you in the past. So God brings us life. This man had an evil spirit in him. When you live in the tombs, you allow evil to overpower you. Nobody could keep him tied with chains anymore. Many times his feet and his hands had been tied, but every time he broke the chains and smashed the irons on his feet, he was too strong for anyone to control him. Don't you feel like that sometimes? You know, all the people who are uh, overpowered by evil in your life? When people are on drugs, there's like nothing you can do. When people are alcoholics, there's nothing you can do to get them away from it. They, they have to want to stop being alcoholics. You could send them to all sorts of rehabs if they don't want to reform and change their lives. If they don't want to get away from the tomb, there's nothing you can do. Same thing with people who are on drugs. Send them to all, you could keep sending them over and over again to all sorts of rehab places. Unless they want to step out of the tomb, there's nothing you can do. Same thing with your family members who may be afflicted with other evil spirits, you know, who may be in the life of sin. Nothing you can do. You can pray for them. That's what you can do. You can pray for them. But in order for them to get out of whatever they're in, the tomb that they find themselves in, they have to be the ones to do it. All these people were trying to restrain this guy what the Bible is trained to tell us here. And nobody could do it because the evil was stronger than your, your power as a human being. Only God's stronger. God is stronger than any of the evil that is there. But nobody could help him. can't help your family members unless they want help. The people in your life. Day and night he wandered among the tombs and through the hills, screaming and cutting himself with stones. 
He, was, he kept hurting himself. And the people who are alcoholics, drug addicts, the people who keep having sex with everyone and anyone, who keep going to prostitutes, the people who keep hurting themselves, you know, with their addictions, like pornography, they keep hurting themselves over and over. The people who keep holding on to grudges, <coughs> resentments, the people who keep hating, they're the ones who keep hurting themselves and hurting themselves. Day and night he wandered among the tombs and through the hills, screaming and cutting himself with stones. And here's verse 6. He was some distance away when he saw Jesus. So he ran, here's your clue, he ran <coughs> to Jesus, fell on his knees before him and screamed in a loud voice, Jesus, son of the most high God, what do you want with me? For God's sake, I beg you, don't punish me. He said this because Jesus was saying, evil spirit, come out of this man. You see, he was the one who went to Jesus. He ran to Jesus. The people around him were not the ones who ran to Jesus on his behalf. He had to do it. Same thing in your life and in the life of the people in your life. So Jesus asked him, What is your name? The man answered, My name is Legion. There are many of us. And he kept begging Jesus not to send the evil spirits out of that region. Now, Legion, a lot of you, when you hear this, Legion, you think to yourself, okay, it's legion because there are many, uh, there are many evil spirits, and that's what this is referring to. But the word legion, remember, this, we're talking about 2,000 years ago when the Roman Empire was in charge of this area. The Gospel of Mark was written for a Roman audience persecuted Christians living in Rome. That is the Gospel of Mark. So this is a, the Roman Empire. Now, the word legion here does not refer to the fact that there are many spirits, evil spirits. The word legion refers to the Roman army. You've heard of the legion of Rome? This is what it's referring to. It's referring to a section of the Roman army. The most powerful division of the Roman army was called the Legion of Rome. Now, let's go in here and look at this. So Jesus asks, what is your name? And the man answers, my name is Legion. There are many of us. The man is afflicted and the man is living in the tomb. He's dead inside because he has Rome in him. It's Rome that is the problem. And what is Rome? See, this, these people would know it 2,000 years ago. The, the audience that Mark is thinking of, that he's writing to, are Roman Christians. The Christians of Rome. They would know this very well. Rome was a filthy society. The Roman society was a filthy society, a depraved society. You've heard of the Roman baths? Everybody would go to these Roman baths and 
everybody would be hooking up with everyone, having sex with anyone and everyone. Didn't matter, you know, who it was. That's what they would do in these Roman baths. It was a filthy society, a sinful society, an immoral society, devoid of morals. We haven't gotten away too far from that mindset in today's day and age. Except people are not hooking up today in bath houses anymore. They do it, I guess, online and here in Las Vegas in the casinos. <coughs> so when I first got there to uh, Holy Family, maybe a couple of weeks after, you know, Boulder Highway here, I'm driving my Honda Accord. Uh, down Boulder Highway, and I stopped at a stop sign, and there was a, a, a bus stop, and a, a lady there, and on this, uh, it was waiting at the stop sign, and she sees me in the car, and my car stopped, and she waves at me. So I thought she was one of you, you know, one of you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a parishioner, you know. <laughs> and she, she waves at me. And so, uh, I waved politely back. <laughs> and at that, she runs to the car. Oh, no. And then I got the, the picture. Okay, I clicked. <laughs> uh, but this is the the great society that we also live in. In Roman times, during Roman times, married couples would only have, like for example, Roman soldiers, since uh, Jesus is referring here to the Roman army, Roman soldiers would be married, they would be married men, but they would only have sex with their wives when they would want the wife to get pregnant. They would have young boys, and the, each Roman soldier would have a young boy that he would have sex with because he wouldn't get the boy pregnant. This is the depraved society that we are talking about. A depraved society, an immoral society. This is what Jesus is referring to. The man is afflicted because he's got Rome in him. In other words, he has the world in him. Many people today have the world in them. They got Rome in them. You know, everything is about power. Romans, power. You know, sex, power, prestige, fame, money. Pope Francis says that the way the devil enters our life is through our pockets, through our wallets. That is the way the devil enters your life. That is why my wallet is empty. <laughs> but if you think about it, when you start focusing and making the point of your life and the object of your life, and the focal point of your life, mm -hmm. money, 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 the devil then takes over. See, Jesus says very poignantly, we are to live in the world, but not be of the world. In the world, but not of the world. We can, you can work in the casino, but not have any need to take part in what's going on there. You have no need to take part of what's going on there. You will notice in just a little bit, we will be hearing here in this particular story about pigs. I was talking not too long ago with uh, a group of teenagers in our confirmation class. 
And I said to them, you know, you have to lead a moral life. Follow the Ten Commandments of the Lord. Follow the teachings of our Holy Church. Follow the Catechism of the Church. Get away from sin in your life. And they say, oh, Father. <laughs> you want us to be like nuns <laughs> and monks, you know, who don't know what it's like to try things, you know. Like, you gotta try marijuana, it's legal. <laughs> I said, well, you know, just because something is legal doesn't mean it's good for you. You know, potheads, yeah. people who smoke marijuana, they fry their brains, they walk around talking, hey man, <laughs> what's up? Is that what you want to be? <laughs> huh? The tribe? Is that the mentality? Jesus will tell us right in a, in, in a little bit, you know, the trying mentality that, you know, that you have to discover, investigate. That is the mentality of a pig, that you have to discover and investigate. I lived on a farm in Poland. We had pigs, and pigs are great investigators. <laughs> <laughs> they go around with their nose looking where they're going to stick their nose into. <laughs> you know? When you have that mentality, you know, come on, they said, Father, you know, you got to try nightclubs, try drugs, try alcohol, try getting drunk. You know, we have no need for that as Christians, as followers of Jesus. We, the Bible says, are called to have the mentality of an eagle. The eagle flies, looks down, sees what's going on, sees the manure that the pigs play in, and just flies over and has no need to get involved in that. We just fly over, Look, and that's it. We have no need to get involved. That is our mentality as followers of the Lord Jesus. For we see the results. And we know the results of people who get involved in behavior that is unbecoming of a follower of the Lord Jesus. We know that. And so, Jesus is referring here to Rome being as part of him. And when he gets healed, Jesus takes Rome out of him, which is what he wants to do to all of us, drive Rome away from us. When Rome is taken out of you, you live with the Holy Spirit in you. When the Legion leaves you, you have God's Spirit in you. So now look here. There was a large herd of pigs nearby, feeding on a hillside. So the spirits begged Jesus, send us to the pigs and let us go into them. Where does Rome belong? With the pigs. The Roman lifestyle is a pig style. The Roman lifestyle, the sinful lifestyle, the legion lifestyle belongs with the pigs. It's for the pigs. He let them go, and the evil spirits went out of the man and entered the pigs. And the whole herd, about 2,000 pigs in all, rushed down the side of the cliff into the lake and was drowned. The pigs drowned in the 2,000. Now when the Bible says 1,000, it doesn't mean that there were actually 2,000 pigs. In biblical, in the biblical world, anything that is exaggerated just means there's a lot of them. So 1,000 means there were a lot of pigs there. 
like the feeding of the 5,000, it doesn't mean that there were 5,000 people there. It just means that there were a lot of people. The Bible exaggerates to make a point. Here the Bible is saying that there were a lot of pigs. And look what happened here. The man who had been taking care of the pigs ran away and spread the news in the town and among the farms. People went out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they saw the man who used to have the ma, the legion, the legion. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had the legion of demons in him, sitting there, clothed in his right mind. Now it's clicking. I can see it. The light bulbs are going off. Do you understand? The legion, Rome has left him and he's in his right mind. Now everything is connecting for you all. Of course it is. I can just see it. It's connecting. Rome is driven out and the man is in his right mind. Clothed in his right mind and they were all afraid. And why are they all afraid? I'm going to tell you why they are all afraid. I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to tell you. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the man with the demons and about the pigs. Why are they all afraid? So they asked Jesus to leave their territory. Why are they all afraid? Because when the pigs drowned, Jesus took the demons out of the man who had been possessed by them and threw them into the pigs and the pigs drowned. These men were keeping the pigs. They were the ones, their job, their livelihood, their business was pigs. And when the pigs drowned, that destroyed their business. It destroyed their money. So what are they, what are they afraid of? They're afraid that Jesus is going to drive more, more demons out of people and more pigs are going to drown. And what will that affect? Their money. And so they tell Jesus, they beg him, get out of here. We don't want you, Jesus, because you're affecting our money. We don't want you. Isn't this today? We don't want people to stop drinking, stop doing drugs because that affects money, doesn't it? Look what's going on in Mexico today, the war. It's all about money. We don't want demons to be driven out of people because it affects money. It affects money. We don't want people to stop with their casino addictions because it affects money. I was told by many people that I, here in Las Vegas, that I could not talk about casino addictions. Mm -hmm. Because it affects money. I'm more worried about what the Lord will say than what people will say. Many times, even in the church, we can be very concerned about money. Mm -hmm. It's all about money in many ways. Isn't it? In the, even in the church business. That's why, you know, uh, when I was married, a number of priests gave us the advice don't talk about controversial things. <laughs> Don't talk about, because that drives people away. And when they go 
They take their checkbooks. <laughs> they take their money. So many, in many ways, you know, you you go to church and it will all be very bland, won't it? You know, love, hope, you know, <laughs> charity. Just very bland subjects. Let's not touch anybody's buttons. Let's not make people uncomfortable because they'll leave. And when they go, because they don't like some, they don't like what they're hearing, then they take their money. Mm -hmm. But then religion becomes all about money. And isn't it like that? In today's United States of America. The Protestant churches, the evangelical Protestant churches, it's all about money in many ways. 10%! If you don't give 10%, God's not happy with you. And if you don't give 10%, you're going to go to hell. 10%! So the pastor can have a private jet. <laughs> 10%! You need to give 10%. I sometimes go to different Protestant services, uh, and a large portion of the service is dedicated to the offertory. Try it, go sometimes. So the large section is on offertory. You know, there's even churches, and I'm not just saying uh, Protestant churches, there's even Catholic churches, that now they have kiosks as you walk in. What? You can swipe your credit card right there. <laughs> yeah. You can swipe your credit card right when you walk in. When we are more concerned about money than about people, we are doing the work of the devil. When we are more concerned about money than people, these people here, these men who kept, who had their business, were more concerned about their business, their money, than about this man getting in his right mind. Uh -huh. That is wrong. And that is evil. You have to be concerned about people. People come first. A lot of people in the Catholic Church, you know, uh, and they complain. Ah, you pass the basket around twice. <laughs> Anybody force you to put anything in there? No. Those who talk the most are the cheapest ones. <laughs> Nobody ever forced you to put anything in there. You want to put something in there? Fine. If you don't, don't. Keep your mouth shut. You don't pass the basket. You don't like it? Well, nobody's forcing people to give. You don't want to give? Don't. And that's the way, because in the, in the church, the Catholic Church does not believe in 10%. You don't have to give 10% be right with God or to be blessed. The Catholic Church believes in sacrificial giving. Every, you know, my whole life has to be about giving, you know. Not just money. That's easy, you know. Writing a check is easy. Some of you have a lot of money, you know. For you to write a check is very easy. Give your life, you know. Actually help somebody get out of Rome. Maybe when they're depressed or they're lonely. Huh? That's harder, isn't it? You know, that is, give up your time. That's harder. You know, I ne I'm never impressed when somebody says, oh, I want to take you to a very nice restaurant. Think they're going to impress me. Take me to a restaurant. Okay. Somewhere on the strip. Oh, no. You know. 
But if somebody says, oh, well, cook a meal for you. Oh, wow. Oh, that's, right, you know, some of you, when was the last time you cooked a very nice meal for your family? Nice one, you know, took time doing it, made tortillas from scratch, not bought them in the La Bonita. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> or Walmart, but actually made them from scratch. Mm, now that's, that's impressive, isn't it, that you took the time. So, the man says, as Jesus was getting into the boat, this is verse 18 now, as Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had the legion of demons in him begged him, let me go with you. He says, Jesus, I want to go with you. He, wants, he wanted to go with Jesus. But Jesus would not let him. Instead, he told him, go back to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how merciful he has been to you. How many of you, you know, after we've been healed and touched by the Lord, and I see this all the time, people who've been touched by the Lord, now they want to sleep in church. Well, they want to sleep in church. There's mass in this church on this day. There's this group on this day. This goes on in this. Go to your family. Go to your family. Clean your house, in other words, before you go and clean the street. It's, in many ways, it's easy to go and preach to people on the outside. It's harder to actually preach to people in your own family, people in your own house. Isn't this what Jesus said? A prophet is not welcome in his own land. That's harder. It's harder to be a healing instrument in your own family. Because they, they tell you terrible things, don't they? You know, like, oh, you think now that, that the Virgin Mary has appeared to you, that you're all holy now. And they bring you down. They know the buttons to push in your own life. And yet, this is what we're called to do. First, to evangelize our own circle, our own family. How do you do that with your life? Don't go on preaching to your family members, telling them, you know, you need to do this, do this, do this, do this. They're not stupid, okay? They know if they're wrong, they know. Everybody has a conscience inside of them that tells them that the conscience inside of us is the voice of God. Everybody has a conscience that's God in them, baptized or unbaptized. Every human being is born with a conscience and God speaks to us. Your family members that are doing wrong know they're doing wrong. Don't speak so much to them about God but speak to God about them. Spend more time speaking to God about them than you do speaking to them about God. They don't want to hear it. So you pray for them. How much time do you spend praying for them? Double it! And be kind. Be merciful. Kill them with kindness. With your love. With your example. 
And you go about your own, you know, merry way, following the Lord Jesus. And you evangelize your own circle before you start going and evangelizing the street. Clean your house first before you go and clean the street. And for some of you, that may be literal, to clean your house first. So the man left and went all through the ten towns, telling what Jesus had done for him. And all who heard it were amazed. He went and he went to his own people, his own circle, and told them all that Jesus had done. If somebody asks you, you tell them. Mother Teresa is a great example for us about preaching the gospel. And the missionaries of charity, which she founded, do not proselytize, which means you don't have to become Christian in order to be served by them. And yet, many people in India have been converted to Christianity, to Catholicism, not by the works of the bishops or the preaching of the bishops in India. There's very few Christians in India, and the Catholic Church has been around for a very long time. And there's lots and lots of priests in India. That's why many, many of them are being uh, shipped all over the world because there's a lot of priests in India but very little Catholics very few conversions because the people look at the way that priests live in India and bishops live in India and they want nothing they want no part of it but many people have been touched and converted by the work of Saint Mother Teresa of Calcutta. And they were touched and converted by her work. Not by her words, but by her work. And the work of the missionaries of charity. And when people asked, you know, Mother, uh, they said to her, uh, how come you all don't talk to people about Jesus? You know, how come you don't preach to them. And she said, our life preaches. Our life evangelizes. In other words, we are the best Bible that people read with our life, our example, our kindness. And you know what? You may be the only Bible anybody may ever read in your life. Many of the people that you come into contact with, you may be the only Bible they may ever read. They may never set eyes on another Bible or an actual written Word of God. We've got the Word in us. The Word became flesh and dwelled among us. You've got God in you. And one of the things that is interesting about the work of Mother Teresa is when she would be caring for the people, the most destitute people, the rejects, when she'd be bandaging their wounds and caring for them, many of them would ask her, why do you do this? And she would say, I do it because of Jesus. And then they would say, who is this Jesus? You see? So you don't have to go around, you know, with a microphone proclaiming the gospel. Our life has to be of the gospel. And the gospel is the good news. So you have to be good news for all the people in your life. Are you? Because if we're not good news, that means we're bad news. <laughs> So we have to be good news to all the people in our life. And in that sense, participate in the healing of the world, in the driving out of demons in the world, in the driving out of demons in the life of all the people around us. That's what this man did. 
That's what Jesus charged him with. And that's what he charges us with as well as we pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, this day for coming and feeding us with your word and the many demons that are afflicting us. We ask you to, through your power, to drive them out. Take them far away from us, those demons that are not allowing us to enjoy our life, the abundant life that you have in store for us, the life that you have brought us. And as we pray today, we ask your blessing to come upon us in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat>